and excuse me, I'm just hitting record. So disfigurement is an often neglected and misunderstood identity and equality issue. We use the term disfigurement, facial difference, visible difference interchangeably, recognizing that preferred language can differ from country to country. To date, we believe that disfigurement has not been mentioned once in a universal periodic review to the Human Rights Council in over 90,000 recommendations. The CRPD extends to the facial difference community thanks to the human rights slash social model. But we know that this is not adequately reflected in the laws and practices of some states who have signed up to the convention. This includes the UK and the USA. Often, medical models of disability fail to recognize the unique experiences of the disfigurement community it's also common to speak with disability organizations, activists, groups that have not previously considered their duty to represent this community. And with this panel representing the only non-profit profits accredited by the CRPD to represent the disfigurement community, we want to ensure that the CRPD has access to the expertise right here, here as an underrepresented group within disability. We also know that Laws on their own are not enough. Wider societal change is urgent, urgently needed. One of the general principles of the convention in Article 3 requires respect for difference and acceptance of persons with disabilities as part of human diversity and humanity. Despite this, the social barriers and stereotypes facing people with facial differences are both persistent and insidious. For example, people in this community face a constant barrage of negative stereotypes from the film industry, with facial difference commonly used to represent evil or immorality in films such as Bond, The Lion King, Star Wars. Interviews from our recent project in India and Nepal also told us that people with disfigurements are often denied disability status, which is vital to seeking expensive medical treatments in a low-income setting. These are just a few examples of how disability laws, programs and spaces are not adequately serving the disfigurement community, despite many countries recognizing disfigurement legally as a disability. So how do we ensure people with disfigurements are afforded the protections, rights and accommodations that they deserve? The extent to which state parties across the globe can better protect people with disfigurements is yet to be explored. And the UN CRPD procedures and values can play a crucial part in this process. Basic Quality International aims to consult with experts through lived experience and occupation to explore workplace discrimination and how employment policies can lead to economic and social empowerment of this community. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to this team of experts right here and introduce your panel. So the first panelist I'm going to hand over to is Sora. Thank you, Philida. My name is Sora J. Kasuga. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. I'm the co-founder of Circovation and a face equality activist. I'm Japanese American. The left side of my face is swollen and my left eye is red due to venous and lymph lymphatic malformations that I've had since birth. My head is mostly shaved with a mop of curls on top cascading down over one side of my forehead. And I'm wearing a gray blazer and red lipstick. 15 years ago, I returned to the US after spending half a year in the United Kingdom attending circus school, graduating as one of the longest running featured acts in our touring student show. A week earlier, I had sat in a meeting with the owner of a circus and was offered a contract for the next touring season. I left the UK to get my life ready to go on the road. And when I arrived back home in the United States, I opened my computer expecting to receive a contract. But instead I found a note in my inbox from the owner of the circus that started with, unfortunately, I am unable to offer you work for the 2009 season. 
and ended with a list of superficial reasons and an assurance that it wasn't because of my talent. It was a complete 180. I found out later that I had been dropped because he was concerned about what people might think when, after the show, we, the performers, performed meet and greet with the audience on their way out. What would happen when guests saw me up close instead of 12 meters in the air? When I got on my first North American circus tour, the choreographer on the show saw me dance on my first day and said, we have to feature you in one of the acts. You need to be center ring and on a platform. I was elated. And then a week passed and she approached me and there was frustration all over her face. And she said, I just got out of a meeting about that featured spot. The boss won't allow it. I'm so sorry, I really fought for you. And nothing more needed to be said. A few years later, I started working for a production company at a casino nightclub. At the end of the night, I finished my trephies set, lights flashing, beats pounding, hundreds of party goers cheering and dancing. I blew a kiss at the audience as I left the spotlight. And once backstage, I was intercepted by my new boss, who said, great job. We're really excited about working with you. And then he paused for a flash of a second and looked away. And when he looked back at me, he said, but when you come back next week, we're gonna have to ask you to cover your face. It was an ultimatum. Either I do this or I lose my job. And I swallowed my deep unease at this thought and just said, well, I guess that's how it is in the entertainment industry. If you have also ever thought that the entertain entertainment industry was reserved only for the most beautiful, then I would invite you to think about what we consider to be aesthetically superior and why we hold so tightly to the specific narrow standard of beauty. In the US, that standard of beauty is largely built on Eurocentrism and is extremely racist and ableist. By this standard, we with disfigurements are always portrayed as villains or objects of pity. And yeah, I said objects because that is really what it is. And while, you know, some sectors of disability are being authentically featured more recently in Hollywood and in advertising, people with facial differences are completely left out at best. But in reality, the historical disfigurement paradigm is evil, sad, and unworthy. By authentically representing us in media, meaning having stories that represent us as everyday humans rather than two-dimensional tropes, that perception shift, changing hearts and minds through representation, will be key to unraveling society's long-held beliefs about who we are. My stories are just one drop in the vast sea of lived experiences by people with facial difference. And while my situations were hard, I consider myself extremely lucky. Globally, those who live with disfigurement experience outsized violence and abuse, being ostracized from family and society, chronic workplace discrimination, and debilitating mental health challenges. Our struggles are always invisible, ignored, and or brazenly reduced to insignificance. Even the current body positivity movement stops short of including the face. Our faces are central to connection and communication. And so when we are disfigured from birth or by disease, accident, assault, or war, we are met with experts telling us we need to fix ourselves or otherwise experience social death. And if we are not able to be fully fixed, then in turn, we bear the crushing perception that we are less than human. For most of my life, I felt extremely alone and isolated in my visual differences. The experiences I speak of wreaked havoc on my well-being, leading to both major physical injury and endless mental breakdowns over a 15-year career. When I discovered that there was a whole community out there with similar lived experiences, everything changed. 
My activism comes from a deep love for the facial difference community and a fierce belief that we deserve more. We don't need to be fixed, society does. So from my heart, all I ask is that you see us and believe the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sora. I'd like to hand over to Christina, please. Thank you so much, Philida. My name is Christina Raj and I'm from India. Well, I'm the founder of Center for Ethiosis Related Members, India. And it's a support group which I started 12 years ago. I was born with a rare genetic skin condition, severe ethiosis, a rare combination of uh, lamellar, harlequin, EB, and wild Marquesani syndrome, which is one in three million. I'm the oldest survivor in Asia and Africa as of today. I'm highly susceptible to heat and sun, and in summer, I suffer the most. I have to bathe almost seven to eight times, and I'm prone, I'm prone to overheating, extreme tachycardia, which leads to frequent uh, heat exhaustion and stroke. My vision, hearing, mobility, and finger dexterity are affected, which makes me highly dependent on my family members. And here, my husband is my caretaker because, and he has to help me throughout the day. I'm highly dependent on him. And as age progresses, things become very difficult for me. And even to even drink a cup of coffee, I, I'm almost clumsy like a small child. Ethiosis patients are ostracized, harassed, abused, spat upon, and even physically assaulted. We don't get admission in schools and colleges. We don't get jobs. And there's a huge disparity in salaries. We are expected to work more, more than others, because they, people, society thinks that they are doing us a favor. The severe dry skin gives a very scaly uh, appearance all over, and skin keeps peeling, which causes disfigurement. And people address us as snake, reptile, crocodile. And we are subject to extreme mental torture because of these kind of names. Nobody, uh, rarely they remember our names. The entire family, in fact, faces humiliation in underdeveloped and developing countries in Asia and Africa when, when it comes to legal and justice. My house and land has been occupied. I've been fighting for almost 36 years. And even after getting the judgment in my favor, my house is still being occupied by the illegal occupants who refuse to budge. They say, you don't require a house because you will die any day. I am living on my meager savings and which is fast depleting. My neighbors have attacked me on multiple occasions. Earlier, they used to harass me by uh, cutting off water and power to my flat. But now they have gone an extent, even after multiple complaints to the law enforcement and to the judicial. There has been no warning because looking at my condition, people don't even listen to me. They don't even have that eye contact. They just dismiss me off. So the neighbors have become more bolder. Now they have sought to physical violence now, which has left me hurt. And nobody has, even the complaint which I've given has just been scrapped. So I think that I'm a nobody in this world. People don't listen to me. We do not have the disability status here and awareness about it theosis is almost zero. Sadly, even most of the medical fraternity don't seem to understand our condition. We need constant medical attention. And also, we are highly dependent on creams and emollients, which are very expensive here in the underdeveloped and developing countries in Asia and Africa. It becomes very difficult for us because without that, we, we will die. And we are always in excruciating pain throughout. In fact, pain is a part of our life. 
I started a support group in India 12 years ago with just five of us. But again, later the group grew to almost 89 members. And now we have members across Asia and Africa because we believe leave no one behind. Everybody goes through the same, be it India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or Africa. The challenges, the problem, the emotional trauma, the physical pain, what they go through is the same. And it will really help if we get representation from the United Nations where we live because I'm not able to reach out to my government to understand that ethiosis yes, is not just a skin. It affects every part of the body and we require help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And please know that we are listening to you here and we know that the, the experiences of the ichthyosis community now, thanks to you. Next, I want to hand over to Kareem. Thank you, Philida. And uh, thank you, Christina. And thank you, Sara. Um, so uh, my name is Kareem Jokum. Uh, my visual description is that I'm a 35-year-old individual living with Trucher Collins syndrome, which is a congenital genetic uh, condition that impacts the structure of my face. Simply put, the bones of my face and some of my soft tissues never fully formed, leaving me with underdeveloped cheekbones, a small bottom jaw, and microtia, where uh, my outer ears never fully uh, developed. As a result, I'm completely deaf without my bone-anchored hearing aid. And uh, when I was born, my parents were told that I would never be able to speak. But here I am, and uh, good luck trying to get me to stop talking, though. Um, growing up, uh, the son of two Afro-Caribbean immigrants in Toronto, uh, Canada, has actually exposed me to um, anti-Black racism. I've been pulled over for driving while Black. And growing up with a hearing loss has placed numerous barriers to my social, academic, and economic success. And growing up with a facial difference has separated me from my peers. I was bullied in school, and I continue to have to deal with staring in public and presumptions about my abilities and my intelligence. My lived experience is one that many people share. It is one of intersectionality. To this day, when I experience discrimination, for example, when somebody stares at my face on a train and then gets up and decides to switch seats, I don't know what caused it. Was it my skin color? Are they confused by my hearing aid? Or were they appalled by my facial difference? I know, though, that my skin color is protected by the Human Rights Code of Canada and my home province of Ontario. I know that my disability is covered. However, I cannot say with confidence that my facial difference is covered. The lack of protection is terrifying for many of us with a facial difference. For all my life, I have made conscious choices about what career I would go into. For so many of these careers, you're expected to look a certain way, as Sora mentioned. People are, uh, career opportunities are taken away from people. Newscasters are discriminated against for letting their hair turn gray. Retail jobs become inaccessible because they need beautiful people to work the front counter or the desk. All the finest blouses, suits, cardigans, and socks with stormtroopers on them won't increase your marketability when your face needs to go on a billboard as a realtor. I therefore made the decision to go into the medical field as a researcher. For the last decade, I thought that working in academia would be the path of least resistance. Here, people would see me for who I am. My face wouldn't matter so much. It'd be what I know that matters. It would be my skills that would determine how people would respond to me. And yet, a few years ago, I had a disagreement with one of my work colleagues who immediately went to some other colleagues to complain about me and went into an expletive-laden rant about my face. What's worse, they didn't say it to me directly. They said it to my other colleagues. And I actually didn't learn about this until two years after the fact. Unfortunately, my colleagues failed me and they didn't stand up for me. And you know what? I suppose, how could they? 
there's no clear protection on of facial differences. If the situation got worse and it was reported to the higher ups at my workplace, what would my workplace have done? If it got still worse, what legal recourse would I have had if my workplace had discriminated against me on the basis of my facial difference. Now, today I have the honor of not only speaking to you all as a member of the facial difference community, but as the vice chair of About Face, a Canadian charity with a vision to eliminate the stigma and discrimination encountered by individuals with a facial difference. Our goal is to cultivate equity and opportunity for individuals with facial differences through supportive programming, advocacy, and education. Our programs include post-secondary scholarships for individuals with uh, facial differences, school resources, and peer-to-peer -peer networking. But more recently, uh, last year, we actually launched the No Difference Campaign. It's a national initiative in Canada that aims to promote workplace inclusion and equity for people with facial differences. This campaign features personal stories and videos from people with facial differences who will share their experiences and challenges in the professional world, similar to how we are all sharing today. This campaign provides resources and training for HR professionals and employers to help them create diverse and supportive work environments that respect and value people with facial differences. The campaign slogan is, my difference, should make no difference. Which, if you ask me, and I will, admit, I will admit I am a little bit biased, reflects our mission pretty well. Now, last year we also uh, conducted a survey to gather some insights about the experiences and challenges of um, experience by the facial difference community. The survey results re revealed some key findings that I'll actually share with you now. So first of all, 51% um, of our respondents reported staring or gaping from their coworkers. That's not a great feeling. And half of our respondents reported feeling uncomfortable or having difficult experiences during recruitment, during interviews, just trying to get a job. Half of them have experienced that. I certainly did as well. And more than one third reported bullying or harassment in a workplace. Again, a third reported denial of their facial difference. If there is anything that's tough to hear is when somebody says, oh, I don't see your difference. It's not really there. That's a way of completely invalidating every experience that we've had. And close to half of our respondents reported a lack of opportunities or career progression. Moreover, Nearly two thirds reported that they could not find or were unsure if their school or works equity, uh, equity, diversity and inclusion policies, which we all know as uh, ED for short or EDI, um, included facial differences. Simply put, as individuals with a facial difference, we can't find protection or coverage under in, in many places under human rights legislation, nor the EDI policies of our places of learning or our places of work. The survey highlights the need for more action and awareness to improve the lives of people with facial differences in Canada. And my colleagues here all on this panel would agree, this is something that needs to happen the world over. And this is why all of our organizations are coming together under Face Equality and International to put this message out there. Now, before I finish, I do have one last statistic to provide uh, you from the About Face survey. In Canada, only one third of people with a facial difference identified as having a disability. For the longest time, I considered both to be completely separate identities. You see, under the biomedical model of disability, the focus is on the physical or mental difference as the cause of the disability. The solution, as uh, Sora just mentioned, is therefore to cure or manage it through medical interventions. Strictly speaking, under these terms, my facial difference is not considered a disability. While my hearing loss reduces my functionality and I need accommodations for it, my facial difference doesn't stop me from doing anything. I don't need an accommodation for my facial difference. I need people to stop treating me differently because of it. 
There is a stigma around disability that makes people with facial differences scared to take on yet another label, another burden carry. A biomedical model says you're different. And like Sora said, we need to fix you to be like everybody else. The social model of disability, on the other hand, views disability as the result of the interaction between an impairment and the barriers created by society. These barriers include inaccessible environments, discriminatory attitudes, and unequal opportunities. You may actually see where I'm going with this. These are some of the exact same outcomes that were captured in our survey. You see, I was born this way. I want to be a productive member of the human race and contribute and bring value to the lives of people that I meet. But people look at my face. People look at my hearing aid and tell me, you can't. The social model of disability advocates for removing these barriers and promoting the rights and inclusion of people with disabilities. I think it's fair to say that despite some best efforts in many jurisdictions, the biomedical model still reigns supreme. As someone with a hearing loss, I've learned that I must prove my disability, and then I will receive accommodations. The message is that the problem is with me. I am the problem. There is a lot more work that needs to be done to break past the biomedical model and take the onus off of the function of the individual and place it towards how society treats those that function or look differently. Now, I know that many of you in the audience understand the detriments of the biomedical model and prescribe to more social models of disability. And I'm grateful for that, but it's still here. And it is itself a barrier for those of us with facial differences. The biomedical model excludes people with visible differences, despite the fact that we're experiencing discrimination in many of the same ways as those who are differently abled. And I'm going to say I would know because I'm both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kareem, and to all of the other panelists so far for sharing so candidly, so openly your experiences for the sake of shining a light onto this underrepresented group. And in particular, how that intersects with other identities as well is hugely important. And I fully respect the toll that it takes sharing your stories time after time to bring about change. So if you're able to make a comment in the Q&A box, just to throw some love and appreciation to the panelists, please do that. I will hand over next to Hannah, who can speak to some of the in-depth legal challenges and also some of the research that speaks to the gap between the CRPD social model of disability and how that protects and serves people with disfigurements. Over to Hannah. Thank you, Phil. And, and I'd like to echo what you said. Thank you to Christina, Karim and Sora for that very powerful testimony. I'm a university researcher at Queen Mary University in London. And I've spent roughly the last six years researching the law on visible difference equality at work and how that connects with people's lived experiences. My visual description is that I have chin length brown hair, I'm wearing glasses and a blue shirt. I'd like to talk to you about the workplace experience of people with a visible difference in Britain. Both academic research and evidence from the visible difference community in Britain show that the labour market can disable people with visible differences. Discrimination against people with visible differences can make it harder to get a job and harder to be treated fairly once you're in a job. For example, studies suggest that disclosing a visible difference on a job application form can reduce your chances of getting an interview, particularly if the job you apply for is customer facing. And those kind of workplace studies are backed up by lots and lots of individual accounts. To give you a few examples, one person that I spoke to was told by a manager at work that they would have to get rid of that wonky face if they wanted a promotion. 
Another was questioned at work by a colleague about whether their visible difference might be contagious. And in a survey conducted by the charity Changing Faces in 2017, one participant reported not being allowed to be in the company photograph on the day when the royal family visited because their face didn't fit the company image. Now, of course, not all experiences are negative. People report positive experiences at work as well, where they feel valued and included. But that is still not the reality for many people with a visible difference. There is still a lot more work to do. This issue has also remained largely invisible among, among human resource professionals. So in the research that I've been doing over the last 18 months, I have found almost no evidence of a shared community of good practice among employers about how to make their workplaces more appearance inclusive. In fact, many of the employers that I've interviewed have never actually seen any guidance about this in the professional press. Most didn't know how to identify or remove the barriers to inclusion for people with visible differences at work. My research also suggests that reasonable accommodations are rarely being made or even discussed for people with a visible difference. There is a strong assumption that you can't make adjustments for looking different. But that goes back to a medical model of disability where disability is seen in purely medical or functional terms, not in terms of the social barriers that we've been hearing about today. Overall, I do not believe that the standards set out in Article 27 of the UN Convention are being met in Britain in respect of people with visible differences. Many people with visible differences are not treated equally in the labour market, they are not free from harassment at work, and they do not feel accepted in a work environment which is open and inclusive, all of which are required by the CRPD. Outside the workplace, this negative treatment sometimes continues. For example, in the health sphere, recent research conducted at Newcastle University suggests that people with a visible difference requesting mental health support are less likely to be prioritized than their peers without a visible difference. In terms of criminal justice, research again at Newcastle involving mock jury trials suggests that people with visible difference might be likely to be sentenced more harshly and even denied parole. And in the digital world, there is significant cause for concern as well. In 2017, Changing Faces, the charity, found that a staggering 92% of people surveyed who had used a dating app had received negative comments from other users about their appearance. The, the growing importance and consequence of images in our digital world increases the urgency to do something about this now. We need more research to understand the, 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 the bigger picture, but what we do know so far is really very concerning. Now, given the evidence that I've just summarized, you might be surprised to hear that actually Britain does have some equality law intended to grant rights to people with long-term severe disfigurements. But it's rarely enforced and I believe it's often ineffective. Awareness of this part of the law in Britain is really low. The law itself is really narrow in scope and has lots of technical hurdles and it places the burden of enforcement on the victim of the discrimination. I believe that the CRPD requires so, so much more than that. A different approach, which is designed and monitored in consultation with disabled people's organizations and people with lived experience is really badly needed. Outside of Britain, there's a lack of visibility globally into the problem of disfigurement inequality. We simply don't know the extent to which CRPD principles are being upheld in the lived experiences of people with visible differences across the world. Now that lack of visibility is such a massive concern 
because visible difference is at particular risk of being overlooked where medical model concepts are still prevalent. The CRPD and its country report system represents, I think, a vital opportunity to gather information about this, to provide a voice to the people in this community and to begin that path for change. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And I think your comments around gaining visibility here are particularly pertinent to this conversation. So thank you to the United Nations, to the CRPD for creating this opportunity for us to talk about the diverse experiences of the disfigurement community across the world in the hope that there is something to be done, in the hope that we can increase that visibility and that level of research. So we're going to go into some questions now. And my first question is both to Hannah and to Kareem. So there was a high profile case in recent years that I'd like to discuss. You may well have heard in the audience of the recent decision of the Canadian Supreme Court regarding the rights of an entertainer with a facial difference. Hannah, could you tell us a little bit about this case? And then I'll go to Kareem to tell us about the impact that this has had on the Canadian facial difference community. Yes, absolutely. Um, the proviso being that I'm not a Canadian lawyer, but I have read the case, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, there was a comedian who some of you might have heard of called Mike Ward, who produced a comedy set aiming to poke fun at what he called the sacred cows, by which I think he meant public figures who wouldn't normally be the target of jokes. One of those was a singer who was then 13 year old, 13 years old at the time, who has Treacher Collins syndrome called Jeremy Gabriel. Now, I'm not going to repeat the material in the comedy set, but suffice to say that it included jokes about his appearance, his hearing aid, his mother, and also jokes about trying to drown him because of his appearance. The comedy set was seen by a lot of people. It was very widely distributed. Um, and there was the, the, some evidence that this led to an increase in the bullying experienced by Jeremy, which then had a quite profound effect on his mental state. Jeremy and his parents brought a claim against the comedian, alleging that the right to safeguard dignity had been violated because of his disability under the relevant part of Quebec law. Now, earlier court decisions found in Jeremy's favour, but the case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, which held in favour of the comedian. Now, one of the points that the court had to decide was whether the comments by the comedian were because of Jeremy's disability. And the Supreme Court said, no, they weren't. They felt that the jokes were made because the singer was in the public eye, not because of his disability. I find that surprising given that the jokes were actually about his disability. The Supreme Court then went on and said, but even if that weren't the case, they would need to balance the right to safeguard dignity against freedom of expression. And that meant asking whether a reasonable person would see the comedian's comments as inciting other people to detest or vilify Jeremy, or as likely to lead to discrimination. And again, they decided it would not. Now, to me, that is also surprising, given that the evidence clearly showed that it did lead to additional bullying. To my mind, it's an incredibly disappointing case, which suggests that Canadian law is just not upholding CRPD principles in respect of people with visible differences. It allows entertainment to damage, to create damaging stereotypes about people, including children with disabilities. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Karim, to talk about the, the community impact of that case. Absolutely. Um... Thank you so much, Hannah, for that, uh, that great overview. Um, I think that this case and the outcome really speaks a lot to the points that we've all been making um, throughout this panel. There's simply no protection or recourse for those of us with a facial difference in Canada. Um, Jeremy and I share the same condition, Treacher Collins syndrome. And um, we both have a hearing loss. So we've experienced that 
um, that whole biomedical approach to disability and 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 facial difference. The community a comedian uh, called Jeremy Ward's he, uh, sorry he called Jeremy's hearing aid a subwoofer, and I have the same subwoofer right here, and it was upsetting for me because that was something that had expanded my world and given me so much to suddenly become an object of ridicule. This ruling inherently ignored the social impact of having a facial difference. It was a decision that was firmly rooted in this biomedical model, um, arguing that while the comedian exploited someone for entertainment, it did little more than that. And as Hannah mentioned, it's upsetting for me and so many other people that um, the Supreme Court would rule that um, a reasonable person would argue that the comments did not lead to discriminatory treatment of Jeremy Gabriel. And um, to that, I'd just like to say that, you know, reasonable feels like a bit of a cop-out. 30 years ago, a reasonable person would have been okay with publicly discriminating against the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. 60 years ago, a reasonable person would have been okay with publicly discriminating against people of color. Why is this an exception? Um, and, I, and that's just a question I'd like to pose to everybody. Why? And how is it an exception? And in, in my opinion, it really shouldn't be. Thank you, Kareem. I think you've both highlighted their problems with arbitrary language of the law and the lack of explicit mention of facial difference that is causing a great deal of challenges um, and also re-traumatizing the community as well, that inciting hatred towards the community. Any public example of discrimination towards the facial difference community, we know that leads to wider bullying on the school ground, that leads to permitting wider discrimination in society as well. So that case had a profound impact on the community. I'm gonna hand over next to Tina to talk about your experiences both individually, but also the experiences of the ichthyosis support group as well which has participants all over the world, but what has your experience of the legal system been like in India? The legal system here, in fact, uh, they don't understand our challenges. When we try to tell them that we have a problem and these are the challenges, for example, I cannot go out in the sun, all right? So I told them, I told the cops that I will come in the evening and I will complain or I, I will file a complaint formally but I will he never heard me he said no you will have to come right away I'm not there sitting the entire day waiting for you in fact two years ago when I was walking in the corridor my neighbor's daughter she was a medical student she called the cops and she told that I have a contagious disease and I shouldn't be walking in the corridor and the cops come home and that person, instead of uh, speaking to the medical student, he tells me, in, in fact, he threatens me and tells me, with such a skin condition, why are you even stepping out of the house? You're not supposed to come out of the house. People are getting scared. And this is a communicable disease. This is the word he used. I was shocked. I thought, yeah, he would at least listen to me. He would hear me out. I do understand not everybody knows about it, theosis. Fine, it's a rare genetic condition. I'm okay with that. But I'm here. I want to explain. I want to make you aware of a condition. So if you treat me this way, what will I think? And I was even more shocked. That girl was studying to be a doctor. So what is her attitude if she is in the final year of pursuing her medical profession? So in what way will she even handle the patients? So that was my concern. And another incident was another cardiologist. She rented a flat beside my house. She had a small child. The day she came, I was sitting and my husband helped them with small things because new neighbors. So whatever they wanted, we just helped them. In the evening when she came close and then she saw me, I had a scaly skin. She was shocked and she just went inside the house. And then after two days, they vacated the flat again. 
my husband asked me did you go close to their child i said no i never go close i never i'm here in this apartment for almost 22 years i haven't even stepped in anybody's house because my skin yes i have a scaly skin that keeps shedding and people they they actually do, they get scared when they see me they just run away they slam their doors so it's that it's that, uh, what do you say? It's that rampant everywhere. So when I, now I become strong, okay, now I think, no, earlier I used to get scared. I used to live in isolation. I used to be scared of crowds. But now when I hear, when I meet other children and their parents, they tell the same story. We don't go to anybody's house. Even our extended family has abandoned us. People, vendors, hawkers, they refuse to come come home and sell anything so even I remember I went with my mother to have ice cream she took me when I was five years old so the the vendor seeing me in that condition he just chased us he took a stick and he came running behind my mother and me so I think that was the last time I had an ice cream so these are the things that still edge but now I don't want the other children to go through the same fate what I went through but again it is still there you know even after 30 40 years I still hear the same story still the people keeps telling we are treated in the same way the the, the judicial system or the laws is not very compatible to our they don't help us in any way they don't listen to us so I think we have a long way to go and we need people who would listen really listen to us hear us out and also yes consider us a part of the society thank you thank you christina i want to hand over next to sora um from your experience what would you like state parties and un agencies to know about living with a facial difference thanks Valetta. um how many more hours do we have in this panel <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we yeah, so, today. <laughs> so I just want to expand on some of Kareem's thoughts about disability. And thank you so much to the other panelists, Christina, for sharing your experiences, Hannah, your really important research, and Kareem for everything that you do with About Face and for sharing your experiences. Um, so Kareem uh, talked about the social model of disability. As a Japanese American with a number of other visible and invisible differences, I found my way to feeling powerful in my disabled identity a few years ago through the disability justice movement, um, which has a number of core tenets, a few of which are intersectionality, the wholeness of every disabled body mind, and cross disability solidarity. How one chooses to identify disabled or not is completely valid and the right of every individual to decide for themselves. And I really, truly believe that. That said, my, dis my disabled identity is based on the radical model of disability. Kareem so eloquently spoke about the social model. The radical model builds off of that and recognizes that disability is not good or bad or right or wrong, but something that is holistically part of being human. This model most importantly centers the experiences of those who experience intersectionality. And I believe that regardless of how people decide to identify, our message is clear via the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, on a global level, states' parties must strengthen protections for our community and widely recognize us as a valid group under the umbrella of disability. Like Hannah pointed out, we need national strategies for raising awareness and understanding about people with facial differences. We need cross-community solidarity, both within and outside of the disabled community. And we need protections against discriminatory social attitudes and behaviors with commitment to immediate enforcement. When our access to the world is largely social-based, it becomes hard to prove how disabling our experiences are. It's not as tangible as saying, there's no ramp here, I can't get into the building. 
my greatest wish for the visual difference community is to know that justice is achievable. But right now that is so far from the reality. Last year, when Face Equality International released this report on interpreting disability legislation to assist people with facial disfigurements, it cited two US cases of workplace discrimination. Both went to court post-2008 after the ADA had been amended to broaden protections to include people with disfigurements. Am I still on? Can you still hear me? You're still on, you're just slightly in the dark now. Yeah, so our power just went out. So we'll see how long this this goes on. Hopefully it won't be cut off. Um, so these two cases were cited. Both of them were post-2008 after the ADA had been amended to broaden protections to include people with disfigurements. Neither of the plaintiffs won. As I finished reading the report, I sat in front of my computer and I was like, these are just two cases. There has to be more, right? So I reached out to Dr. Michael Schwartz at the Disability Rights Clinic at Syracuse University, and they generously provided research assistance at my request. Their findings were disappointing, um, but I was grateful for it all. Um, just seven other cases involving facial disfigurements were found, only two of which were post-2008. All of them were lost in court. Over and over again, the courts rejected the notion that people living with facial difference were disabled. Even in a case where the plaintiff said her disfigurement caused her embarrassment in public, the courts never acknowledged this as part of her disability. As far as we know, in the USA, not a single case involving discrimination against people with facial disfigurement has ever been won in court. This here points to one of our biggest challenges, that because of stigma, which causes extreme mental and often physical duress in our community, and because our immediate and accumulated trauma from these behaviors are ignored when determining if we are effectively able to do our jobs, our cases are not taken seriously. As individuals and as a whole community, we keep slamming into the wall of misguided perception. There is real fear of disfigurement, which is fueled by long, a long historical belief in physiognomy, which is an archaic pseudoscience that links facial features with moral character. It argues that the structure of our face makes up what's within our hearts. We as a global society keep buying into this belief, even in modern times, by way of how we are portrayed in movies and treated in society. But in addition to that, I would argue that people in society fear the fragile, ever-changing, day-to-day nature of being human. To ignore facial disfigurement or to openly distance from it, all of that is born from fear. Fear of how it affects one's social status to be associated with someone with a facial difference. As Christina pointed out, fear of being personally perceived as disfigured just by being close to us and maybe fear of what life would look like if it happened to you. I would point out that there is a parallel struggle for the 2S LGBTQAI community and the wider disability community. People don't want to acknowledge us because that brings it too close. That somehow society's ugly perception of us will reflect back, threatening one's very existence and power. That stigma is at the heart of our community struggle. That said, this does not mean that we cannot or do not live full and joyful lives. We do. But, it, but what it does mean is that we cannot do this without the support of our family, our friends, our societal groups, and governments which is why it is crucial to engage in meaningful conversations led by those of us who have the lived experience of visible difference. I have been so fortunate 
to have a solid support network, as you can see from the chat of all of my family and friends who have just showed up to this talk, right? I've been fortunate to have this support network throughout my life. Woven in with the experiences I shared earlier are many more stories of joy, of producers and companies who never once questioned my face, of individuals and communities who welcomed me. But this is by far not the norm for most of the global facial difference community. You heard Christina's story about her home and land that was stolen and about the abuse she faces on the day to day with no enforcement of justice. This is reality. All I want is for people to recognize that all of this is a legitimate issue, legitimate issue which must be addressed immediately because our lives are at stake. You know how people say I don't see race? That's not the solution. In order to eradicate racism, you have to first acknowledge that race exists by recognizing the societal weight and complications of our identities. It's the same for facial difference. See us. And please know, we don't want anybody's pity we want your commitment to value our humanness and fight alongside us. I don't want you to just notice an aesthetic difference. I want you to understand everything that our faces mean. I want you to notice a lifetime of whispers, the stares, the intrusive questions and rude comments, the lifetime of abuse and mental health crises, the jobs and opportunities lost because people couldn't forge past their prejudice. I want you to notice how distastefully disfigurement is represented in the media. I want you to notice if you're having a hard time looking at any one of us right now as we speak. And I also want you to notice the wisdom and power that every single person in the facial difference community brings to the table because of our differences. The world must listen to us must let us lead because we can shape societies to be more compassionate, more humanizing, and that will benefit everyone. Imagine what would happen if we as a whole society could love ourselves and each other more, not because of the arbitrary measure of our appearances, but because of the vast and complex humanity each of us holds. I'd like to end with a quote from my dear friend, David Roche, who I just love and adore. He is a pioneer in the fight for face equality. He says, people with facial difference have a deeper understanding of the human condition better than others because we've had to find our own inner beauty. We're not castaways or throwaways. Because of our wisdom, we can help you find that inner beauty too. I really appreciate everyone who's come to the panel. Thank you so much, Philida, for your wisdom and guidance and leadership. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. What an incredible statement there from Sora and from each and every one of you. Your expertise, your wisdom, your candor is so appreciated. There is no denying the weight of this. There is no denying the body of human experiences that speak to the deep rooted inequalities that this community is experiencing right now. What we need to do now is use the remainder of this time to turn the tide because right now the burden is on the community to prove that there is an issue and also the burden is on the community to come up with the solutions. So with this final 15 minutes, and I'm happy for it to overrun if everybody else is, we want to hear if you are watching this, if you are a representative of a state party, a representative of the United Nations, please use the Q&A to let us know you're here. I can happily promote you to be a panelist should you be willing to step up and give us some advice. We want to know what the short to medium term steps are to ensure that the CRPD is adequately serving this community, to ensure that there is recourse, to ensure that we are building a body of evidence to change state party laws and make sure that they are serving this community. So please use the Q&A now. If you're a representative of the UN, tell us what we can do. Tell us how we can move this issue forward. 
If you are not, if you are a member of the community, if you also have similar experiences that you want to bring to the floor, again, use the chat box. We will be using this panel, not just for the sake of today, it's being recorded. It will be a tool long into the future that when we have this open dialogue, we have this body of research, we have this body of human experiences to prove that there is an issue here. And also to ensure that this community is no longer resigned to the fact that there is nothing to be done. There is something to be done. We have a space here, right here today, um, but it's not up to us to come up with all of the answers. So. I believe there were a few committee members from the UN who were watching previously. If you're still here, please let us know. Um, I can hand over the floor to you if you're willing to come forward and pose to us some steps. We need, we need answers here. This, we've gone too far. Um, if not, we will take questions from any of the attendees to do you want to ask some of our panelists for their expertise about how to move this forward in your country or what laws might exist to protect you at this point in time I'm really hoping there are some representatives of the United Nations that might be willing to come forward and engage in a dialogue on this Failing that, we will go back to our panelists for wider questions and discussion. I guess an important topic that we haven't yet discussed right here is the, the factor of disability status. I wonder, Christina, whether you perhaps could tell us some of your experiences trying to seek disability status in India and whether that could be an incredible tool in a low income setting to get access to vital resources that is being denied for people with facial differences and disfigurements. Christina, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> yes, it's it uses not only affects the skin, it also affects the other organs, especially even especially as eyes, you know, and joints. So most of the children who have severe atheosis, they, they lost their vision or they just have partial vision. So when they went to the doctor, when they went to the hospital for the disability certificate, most of them did not get a certificate for the skin or for the eyes, but they got a certificate stating that they are mentally challenged. And initially, since most of the parents are from rural areas, they did not understand this. They thought, okay, whatever the disability, at least we, we have a certificate and we help our child. But now as the child is growing, the child, it becomes difficult for the parent, child to get admission in school because they say your child is mentally challenged. So how can we give admission to your child in school? And now as the child, as the person grows, now same. You can't, that person is unable to even uh, live in the society. That there is one person, one one gentleman who's twenty eight years. He's still treated as he's just a rubber stamp at home. They don't even ask him anything. They don't because they say you don't have brains. So it becomes a big challenge, and he keeps crying. He says, "I do understand. I'm not mentally challenged. I don't know why they gave me this certificate." I wanted something wherein, you know what, I have a problem. I can't go out in the sun, right? It is a challenge. I cannot do any outdoor work. That is a challenge. I have problems with the vision. That is a challenge. I'm not able to stand for long. I, my feet are cracked and it's bleeding. So this is a challenge. But again, nobody is there to understand. They say, no, you, you're, it's not, we never heard about it. So that becomes a real challenge for us, you know to say that no, ethiosis also has, should come in the disability category so that everyone benefits from it. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I guess that's an example of both the need for disability status, but also the need for wider disability awareness and respect and understanding and discrimination to be eradicated around it as well, because there's no point having disability status if it then becomes a barrier to fulfillment and to having equal opportunity. 
Thank you for sharing that. There's a comment in the Q&A directly for you, Christina, where um, Laura has said I th that you quoted you to say, I think I'm a nobody. I understand this context, how powerless it can feel to look differently. But I just want to say the community service is a massive reminder to me and hopefully to you speaking here today, you are absolutely a somebody. Thank, Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much. I wonder whether there are, again, any brave representatives from the United Nations that might be willing to pose a question to our panel in the Q&A, or perhaps ask whether you might be willing to come forward. Um, someone has written to say um, they're a program coordinator at Inclusive Development Partners, which does a lot of work, including disability inclusive education in developing countries. I welcome insight on what teachers, education administrators and other educators should know about the rights of learners, teachers and school staff with facial differences and how to make schools more inclusive environments for them. Andrea, I would encourage you first off to go to the Face Quality International Resource section on our website. There is plenty of schools, materials, tools for educators to create appearance inclusive um, education settings. Um, there are a body of uh, resources on that resource hub. So that's facequalityinternational.org. There may well be some other recommendations from panelists as well, um, but that also has a host of resources from different organizations from within the Face Equality Alliance, including About Face, which Kareem is here representing. Um, there's also a question from Adele saying, how in the future can we pr prove the subtle microaggression um, person's experience in the workplace? That is a very good question. I wonder whether any of our panelists have any insights from their research or their projects into how we can prove that. Proving microaggression is, I, I, I suppose, a great challenge for lots of communities, um, but it's not a reason not to speak up about these experiences. If you're recognizing it as a microaggression, then it is worthy of calling out. Um, I will just write the web address for Andrea now um, and anybody else that wishes to access resources from organizations across the Face Equality Alliance. Could I just quickly speak to Adele? Hey Adele, it's good to see you here. I'm really happy you made it. Um, you know, I feel like you know, we, we come up across this a lot in our workplaces where how do you prove uh, social ostracization or, or discrimination, right? How do we prove that? And the short answer is unless there are witnesses, you can't really, but the more we're vocal about our experiences in a way that is safe, feels safe for you or anyone else to do so, right? We don't want to, um, we need to keep ourselves emotionally safe, but also like if you are willing or if anyone is willing to be vocal about their experience as a person living with facial difference, that starts to plant the seeds in other people's brains about the challenges that we face. And then those people may start to notice the microaggressions too. So right, the more we talk about it, the more we're able to like be visible um, and again, in, in the ways that keep us safe, um, then, then we can like start getting people on board. Right. So lately I've been talking about, like, I'll be like elbowing my husband, Josh, when we're talking, uh, to someone else and I'll be like, Hey, did you notice that that guy wasn't looking at me at all when talking to the both of us? He only looked at you why do you think that is, right? And I, you know, I talk about it because it all, one, it bothers me and I want to vent, but also like, I just like, as I notice it more, I just want to talk about it more because I'm like, well, this is a real thing and other people, I want other people to notice that it's a real thing as well. So that may be one step. 
Thank you, Sora. And Hannah, um, you've got your hand raised too. Yeah, thank you. I just thought I'd, I'd come in again on Adele's point, if I may, just to say I, I agree with Sora and, and Phil in terms of what you said about calling it out, explaining how it perhaps makes you feel, provided it's a, a context where you feel comfortable with, with doing that. And, and I guess that depends. Um, I suppose the other thing to say is, uh, obviously, I, I don't know where you live and um, I'm not a global expert on, on the laws of all countries or anything. So I, I couldn't say from a legal perspective, but I, I can say that often people tend to assume in the UK, for example, that, that they have to prove something and they need some kind of smoking gun. But sometimes the law might have ways of um, helping you with that. So it, it kind of depends on, on, on where you live and what the situation is. But it might just be worth, if, if you feel there are repeated micro regressions, maybe seeing if there's a voluntary legal advice centre near you where you could go and speak to somebody who does know the laws in your area and they may have some, some ideas for you. Yeah, and there are some fact sheets, again, on our resource hub specifically geared towards the UK and the US to try and break down your the laws in those particular countries and that does have workplace guidance as well um, and there's some guidance also on our website specifically for the UK which Hannah developed um, so again that's a good place to start if you're looking for some additional information or drop us an email um, head to our website again if you would like some more information on anything in particular after today We'll do our best to signpost you to that if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then it really helps us to steer the direction of the face equality movement in future. So if there is a resource, if you are a community member that wants more around this, you want to widen out this discussion, please get in touch with us and we'd love to hear from you. Um, so we've just got someone saying I want to say thank you everyone on the panel for sharing your story. How can I do better? I know that's an open ended question but I would like to know, and I feel there are people in the world that may want to know too. Um, that is quite an open-ended question and I'm assuming it's a general society question. Um, so I will hand over to my panelists to answer that question. Does anyone wanna raise their hand? Go on, Kareem. Thank you. I mean, that is that is a great question. I love that you you left it open ended. Um, I think that uh, something that I learned um, actually very recently was um, actually when we had the Face Equality International uh, uh, Conference just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, one of the uh, social workers that works with About Face, Colleen. Uh, had us watch a video about the difference between empathy and sympathy. And I think that being able, I mean, I wish that I had the link right here, right now. I could probably look it up and probably give it to Phil how to put it into the chat. But it's, I think that what I learned from it is that as an individual with a facial difference, I don't want somebody to see me as an object of pity. Um, Sora mentioned this, you know, like we, we've all alluded to this um to some degree in this panel we don't want to be pitied we don't need sympathy which is essentially saying oh yeah you know at, at least you're alive at least you have a partner at least what are like you we don't want sympathy we, we would we, we prefer empathy we prefer people to make a connection with us we prefer people to try to take steps to advocate to to, to, to basically like look at what we go through, empathize with it. And when I said advocacy, advocate, I don't necessarily mean like come out and be like, I'm speaking on behalf of, sometimes it's just as simple as using your position, um, using where you are to make space for somebody with a facial difference uh, or a visible difference of any kind to come out and speak their truth. And so I, I think that really, it's just all about making a connection between yourself and somebody else with a facial difference, but also using your position so that our society can connect better with us as individuals with facial differences. Um, so that itself might sound a little vague, but I think that with that kind of a philosophy, um, you're able to kind of think of 
so many different ways to engage, so many different ways to be a part of the face equality movement. Thank you so much, Kareem. So we are at time, um, and I think it's really important to actually answer the question of someone who uh, is anonymous, but if someone from the UN had spoken up, what would you like to hear from them and what are your next steps with them? Just curious. I think that's a great way to summarize in the sense that this is a wonderful, beautiful, united echo chamber that we have right here of a community that we are building and we are building that critical mass. But I get the feeling that sometimes we are all too often speaking to people that already care, that are already affected that are the ones experiencing this day in, day out. And yes, we have a space here at UN COSP and we are so grateful for that, but we're gonna be working our way up the program year on year. We want an in-person slot. We want to be speaking directly to state parties. And I'll hand over to Hannah after this for the more kind of technical, practical steps that we are looking for but we want country reporting systems. We want to ensure that state parties that have ratified the CRPD, so have made this commitment to protecting and serving people with disabilities of any kind, we want them to be putting steps in place so that there is recourse for the facial difference community and that they're reporting on it. So if they are failing to make good on that promise that they have made, then they are failing the facial difference community too. So we want country reporting systems, we want universal periodic reviews of the UN to explicitly mention disfigurement. And we want to no longer be an underrepresented group within disability. We want to be right there, standing shoulder to shoulder with the disability community and ensuring that laws adequately serve people with facial differences and visible differences of any kind too. Um, Hannah, please, with your technical knowledge, speak further to what we are asking for from the UN. <laughs> Actually, I think you did it beautifully. Um, I think uh, the, the key for me is, is that countries who have signed up to the CRPD are asking themselves these questions and they're consulting with their disabled people's organisations and with the lived experience community to find out the true picture, because we often assume that the they automatically just know what that is but but they may not be correct so speak to the people who do experience it and then we want we, we'd love to see that dialogue with the UN we'd love to see countries talking about what what steps they have in place and what gaps they've identified and, and a dialogue um, in terms of how they can take steps to improve that. Thank you Hannah um, so we've gone over time but I would thank everybody that has either shared their story shared their experiences, their expertise, but also to everybody that has watched this, who is with, with us here, who is advocating for face equality in some way, no matter how big or small those, those efforts are. My ask to you is that when we make this public, when we make this panel a resource that can stand the test of time, share it. If you are active on social media or not, if you're in a dialogue with your family, if you are in contact with local government, this is a resource that we want to get in the right hands um, and make sure that it is seen by the, the people in positions of power and influence and redistribute that power to the facial difference community. So thank you for being here with us and being part of the movement. We are so grateful and here's to being there in person next year at the United Nations front and centre in the uh, agenda. So um, thank you, everybody. And we shall hopefully see you again this time next year in person. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Valida. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, folks.